I'm a 23-year-old guy from the southern US. This happened while I was a night shift cashier at a rundown gas station at the end of summer in 2013, so I had just turned 19. The city I live in has about 10,000 people in it. It's not a big place. I've lived here most of my life. It's a decent place to raise a family and pretty much the most boring place in the world. But the kind of place where, in the bad areas, bums, junkies and drunks just run rampant. This gas station is in this kind of area. In my first week of working there, it became apparent that the few people I worked with were unreliable and that they would seemingly quit out of nowhere. In the first five days alone, I ran off a woman trying to do heroin in the bathroom, I ran off some creep trying to pick up two 13-year-olds, and I had more than a few empty threats thrown my way by a couple of drunks that were on the no-sell list, which I would just laugh off. With that being said, I had grown accustomed to the type of dumbasses that shopped there from time to time. I got plenty used to it, in fact. After about a month of working there, and being the only employee who was worth a shit, I had had to work on my own every now and then. I thought nothing of it. It wasn't that bad, really. The store stayed empty for the most part. One particularly slow night, I noticed the silhouette of a tall, skinny man walking towards the store in the distance. I couldn't make out his features until he got closer. He was in his early 30s, unshaven with stringy, dark hair a filthy grey hoodie, no shirt, black sweatpants and unlaced boots. This guy gave me the fucking chills. As he walked in the door next to the register, he silently glanced at me with a cold, dead, emotionless expression, and then quickly stared at the floor, shuffling along, browsing the three small aisles of snacks and cheap car accessories, and glancing up at me every few seconds. All in all, he stumbled around for two or three minutes, his hands deep in his hoodie pockets the entire time he was in the building, and then quickly hurried out the side door and was gone. I assumed he'd stolen something to eat, and at that point, I didn't really care. The guy was obviously high, and I wasn't about to get stabbed over a Twinkie. Not to mention that my manager had turned into a real asshole, and I had thoughts of quitting anyway so take two more of them while you're at it. The very next day, I was scheduled on a 3 to 11 shift. The afternoon went surprisingly peacefully. A few old people, a couple of cute girls, and a guy in a suit in a hurry. Not many people came in that evening either, which wasn't a shocker as it was getting pretty late, and I sure wasn't complaining. Then, at around 10 o'clock, once again the only one in the store, I see that familiar, tall, skinny silhouette out in the distance. The man from the previous day had come walking down the street, a hand shoved in his pocket like he has a gun, heading towards the entrance. The bell on the door was the only sound in an otherwise completely silent moment. For a few seconds, he gave me that dead stare, seemingly sizing me up. Then went right back to business, browsing the aisles and glancing up at me. By this point, adrenaline is pumping. I'm alone and I'm wondering if he's armed and what I'm going to do if he tries something. A few minutes later, he comes up to the counter holding a small bottle of water with two dollars between the fingers of the same hand and just staring at me. His right hand never left his hoodie pocket. I rang him up silently and handed him his change. He just stood there for about 10 seconds, staring right at me. Then, in a very foreboding, deep voice, says, You need to call the police. My heart sank. Uh, excuse me? You need to call the police. Then, as quickly as he finished repeating himself, he walked out the door. Needless to say, I took that advice very fucking quickly. I locked all the doors, went to the back and called the police. A squad car eventually pulled up, and I gave my statement and went home. I quit not long after that, having finally had enough of my manager and all the bullshit that came along with that job. 
I think about those two nights a lot. I never heard from the police again, and I've never seen that man again, which is strange in the town where you recognize every face. The only conclusion that I can come to is that he knew of someone that was planning something that night, and the cops must have scared them off. There was nobody around outside in the pitch black, and the store was completely empty except for me. What if he hadn't done what he did? Would someone have shoved a gun in my face and taken the money in the register? Or did someone just want to take a human life that night? Either way, moral of the story, don't judge a book by its cover. When we were kids, we all thought that Freddy must be the biggest person in the world. He was six foot five and broad as a refrigerator, and though his sheer size was certainly impressive, his intellect was not. From the mismatched and sloppy clothes featuring children's cartoon characters to the disheveled hair and slack look of disinterest that perpetually graced his features, one look at Freddy was enough to let you know that he was slow. Nobody on the street had ever heard him say a word, and as far as we knew, he couldn't talk at all. He was in his early 20s, which meant that he'd been in the neighborhood for as long as any of us kids could remember, so most of us paid him no mind, and he really wouldn't do much of anything exciting, just stand in the front yard and watch the girls as they came home from school. So, when Freddy followed the schoolgirls of the neighborhood to their homes one day, we found it a little odd, but certainly nothing to be overly worried about. The strange thing was that he did it again the next day, and the day after that too. At this point, us girls started to get a little unnerved, but we didn't think about telling anyone about what was going on. After all, we all knew Freddy. He was harmless, right? So, we just ignored it. A couple of the braver girls tried asking him to stop, but all they got in response was Freddy's slack-jawed stare. You know, I guess he really couldn't talk after all. It seemed like things would just go on like this forever, until what happened to Sarah. Sarah was the one in our group who lived the farthest away from the school, which meant that every day she walked the last half mile to her house alone. Well, not exactly alone. She had Freddy. Well, one day, she never came home. Her mum waited, called our mums, and no one knew where she was. And that's when Eleanor finally piped up about Freddy. Eleanor's mum called Sarah's mum, and Sarah's mum called the cops. When they went to Freddy's house, they found her in the living room, shaking like a leaf as Freddy sat on the floor and stared at her. Her story went that he grabbed her up out of the street and tucked her under his arm like a football, uh, sprinting the distance to his house and setting her down on the living room sofa. She was too afraid of what he'd do to her if she screamed for help, so she just stayed there and closed her eyes. But Freddy, he didn't do anything to her. For the two hours that he had her there, all he did was stare. After that, there was talk of locking Freddy up. But seeing as he hadn't actually done anything to harm the girl, the police let him off with a slap on the wrist and sent an escort to walk the girls home from school every day. That's just the way things are done in small towns, I guess. Well, this didn't sit right with us girls, for obvious reasons. But what could we do? We all figured that we'd be safe as long as the officer was there. Unfortunately, the officer didn't much care for this babysitting duty, and one day, when an emergency call came through the dispatch, he decided to just ditch us and head off to do some real police work. That day, we decided that we'd all walk Sarah to a house together. Safety in numbers, right? We were about a mile from the house when we heard a noise like a wounded animal, and loud enough to make our ears hurt. We all turned around to find the source, and Sarah screamed as she saw it. Freddy was barreling towards us as fast as his tree trunk legs could carry him, mouth agape and wailing. We all booked it, scattering like balls on a pool table. He ignored us, making a beeline for Sarah, when a gunshot cracked the air like lightning. Freddy's shoulder jerked back, but he didn't slow down. 
I stopped for a moment expecting to see the officer, but I didn't. A man had grabbed hold of Sarah with one hand and was waving the gun with the other as he dragged her to a windowless van. Sarah was screaming and biting the man's arms, but he didn't even seem to notice as he dragged her back. I can still remember how wide his eyes were. Uh, the pupils expanded like black bottomless pits, swallowing up the iris. Uh, Freddy's shoulder wound had soaked through his shirt as he raced towards the two of them. The man raised the pistol again and the air was broken by a loud crack, the crack of Freddy's fist slamming into the man's jaw. I have never seen anyone hit someone else that hard since, but the man's face instantly gave way and he flew through the air like a rag doll. Sarah wrenched herself out of his limp fingers and just stood there staring wide-eyed at Freddy, but Freddy didn't say anything. He just patted her on the head like you would a puppy, and then sat down on the ground and stared into space as the blood from his shoulder slowly soaked his shirt. The police investigation revealed that the man had spotted Sarah one day as she walked home from school and had begun following her. Inside the van, they found a rope, duct tape, knives and about a dozen journals filled with psychotic ramblings about Sarah, along with a large supply of PCP. If that wasn't enough to shake us girls up, the police matched his DNA to three open rape murder cases of teenage girls in the state. Freddy ended up being fine, even though the doctor said that he probably should have bled out. The wound hardly seemed to faze him, though. He lost a little function in his arm, but other than that, he was fine. And after that, none of us protested when Freddy wanted to walk us home.